Hello everyone, my name is Miquel Duran. I'm originally from Barcelona, Spain. I'm founder and lead scientist at Ercilia Open Source Initiative, which is an initiative for, for the dissemination of uh, artificial intelligence uh, in low and middle income countries. And I'm currently a visiting researcher and today I'm presenting on behalf of the Drug Discovery and Development Center, H3D, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. I'm extremely happy for, for this opportunity and thankful for it. Um, and and I, hope, I hope you enjoy this presentation. Today, as you know, we'll be talking about um, data-driven drug discovery, and in particular, we'll, we'll be talking about how machine learning can help drug discovery and how machine learning can help uh, handling the, the huge amount of, um, of data and experiments that we are assembling, uh, especially in the last, and, and we have been assembling especially in the last decade. So this is a brief um, outline of, of the presentation for today. Uh, in the first quarter of the presentation, I will talk about the collaboration that uh, our organization, Arcelia, Open Source Initiative and H3D are having, and how we think this can be uh, helpful or instrumental even uh, for, um, for drug discovery performed within Africa. Then uh, after this, we will move towards our proposal, that is the, the, the type of um, uh, research that we are currently conducting and how do we think uh, this can this can help uh, not only our our particular collaboration but also the open source world and, and in general the, the open access uh, scientific community and this is in particular uh, what we call the Arcelia model hub that is a hub of uh, AI models that I will present after that and for you to get a, a better idea of what we are talking about when we talk about machine learning I will present a very simple <coughs> machine learning task or AI task um, for drug discovery and that I, I hope you, you will be able to follow and uh, at, the end, at the end of the presentation in the last quarter I will present a more sort of a real world example where you can really get um, the depth and the complexity of this task and why is it so important that uh, machine learning and data sci um, scientists and data scientists uh, collaborate very uh, very deeply and um, very strongly with experimentalists and, and field researchers. So let's get started uh, uh, with the motivation that uh, H3D and the University of Cape Town uh, and Ercilia, the, the shared motivation that we have uh, to, to, to collaborate towards implementing uh, AI and machine learning models in the drug discovery pipelines. Right, so the, the idea or the bottom line here is that, as you know, drug discovery is extremely expensive. Um, it can take uh, a lot of time and it can take a lot of money to, to basically bring a drug to the market. And, and there has been suggestions, as we will see now, uh, um, of, of applying AI uh, and machine learning, which is in principle cheaper because it only requires computational power, not actual experiments, uh, to accelerate the process of drug discovery. So we really like this figure in which you can see that by applying AI, you can reduce the time that is required to, to discover a drug um, by, at the same time, incrementing the number of molecules that we can consider in the process, that is to increasing our chances of, of discovering a molecule and increasing the throughput overall of, a, of our experiments. We hope this sounds good. We are really encouraged by, by the application, the entanglement of, um, of AI within the daily life of of experimentalists in drug discovery, in particular experimentalists in, in H3D and University of Cape Town. And we are really encouraged by the feasibility of it because AI is in principle cheap. However, um, there are many barriers uh, for the implementation of, of AI in, in practice, in, especially in research institutes, right? Uh, one of them is that the majority of um, artificial intelligence or machine learning papers uh, do not share code. Um, this makes it really difficult to reproduce research uh, when it comes to AI. There are no clear benchmark. There are no clear benchmarks. This means that it's very difficult to know um, how good or how bad an AI model is. Um, this uh, is particularly an acute problem when it comes to experimental validation. There's really most of the papers are not accompanied by experimental validation, which uh, creates a sort of a of a barrier or a crystal wall of communication between experimentalists and, and, and data scientists. Also because AI models are perceived as, as black boxes, as something that is not fully transparent, is, it cannot both be fully understood and cannot be fully um, uh, described uh, within within papers, right? So um, Bottom line here is that strong technical skills are required if we want to implement AI in practice. And even if there is a lot of uh, hype, 
and a lot of promise uh, on, on AI. In practical terms, we are not seeing a lot of implementation of it uh, in the daily life of experimentalists. So let's focus on, on a little bit more on detail on the drug discovery uh, pipeline. I'm sure you are familiar with this figure, um, which describes in a very simplified way, I have to say, uh, how the drug discovery process works or the drug development process works. Uh, most of the drug discovery enterprises start by um, identifying a, a target, a target that is related, usually genetically related to a disease of interest. Once this target has been identified, uh, you want to find molecules that will be able to modulate the activity of this target so that when you inhibit usually this target, you will have a, a, an effect uh, on the phenotype that is on the disease. This implies a lot of experiments um, because you want to identify uh, lead molecules from a starting collection of many, many molecules, usually thousands, hundreds of thousands or, or even millions of compounds. Once you have identified uh, lead molecules that you think are interesting and are able to interact with your target, uh, you need to optimize them so that uh, they have properties that drugs require. For instance, they cannot be toxic, right? And this, this process can take a lot of time um, and a lot of um, circular research, I would say. Um, once you have um, made sure or you think in, pre in preclinical um, um, tests or experiments, uh, usually up to, uh, to animal models that your molecule will not be toxic. Um, you have to test it in clinical trials. And as we know, this can take a lot of time and it, it, it takes huge investment. And once you, your molecule, uh, your drug candidate has evidence of efficacy and safety in clinical trials, uh, it's approved and even, even after approval, um, it will get some, uh, some post-marketing surveillance uh, after that, right? So, um, Having a successful drug stably in the market takes a lot of time and takes a lot of money. Of course, there have been re um, <clears throat> there have been claims for machine learning in virtually every step of this process, um, and, and there have been attempts to apply machine learning and artificial intelligence to make this process more efficient overall. Um, for example, there are a lot of machine learning models in the literature that are uh, devoted to identifying the best targets. Yeah, this is gene prioritization uh, models uh, are, are, are prominent and you can find many in the scientific literature. Also, there's a lot of um, machine learning models that are devoted to virtually screen before actually performing the experiments, um, small molecules, so that we can have a more efficient uh, lead identification step. Uh, once leads have been identified, there are a lot of machine learning models that are devoted to optimizing small molecules automatically uh, or semi-automatically with, with the help of medicinal chemists. There are a lot of machine learning models that are related to um, predicting or anticipating uh, toxicity events, etc., etc., etc. Okay, I think that all of this sounds good, but of course, as I said before, um, machine learning models and machine learning modeli modeling might sound um, overwhelming to some, and in particular it might sound overwhelming uh, to experimentalists who have no experience in, in data science. Um, however, uh, machine learning is all over the news. Uh, you might have seen this documentary called uh, AlphaGo. It's a great documentary in, in Netflix and is, an, is a landmark achievement of machine learning, in particular of, in particular of deep learning, <coughs> because uh, DeepMind, which is the company now owned by Google, that developed this algorithm called, called AlphaGo was able to, to beat the world champion uh, Lisa Dola uh, on, this, on this game called, very complex game called, called Go. Actually, this company called DeepMind, you might have seen the news, um, I think it was three or four weeks ago, released an algorithm called AlphaFold that is able to fold proteins only using the amino acid sequence that is the, 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 the primary information that we usually have for molecules it's able to reveal or, or, or predict very accurate, accurately uh, the 3D structure of the molecules. And, and this is a huge achieve, achievement, as you might know, for, for biomedicine, because once you know the 3D structure of a, mo of a protein, you will be able to, uh, to potentially identify small molecules that will be able to interact with it, right? Uh, actually, I, 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 I have to say that when I saw that, <clears throat> that AlphaFold was released, I immediately took 
uh, my my current protein of interest, which is a plasmodium falciparum um, uh, protein, for which there's no uh, three there was no three destructor, only the protein sequence, and only by 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 apply by applying. Uh, with my laptop computer uh, uh, AlphaFold, I was able to reveal this this beautiful structure. As I said, once once you have a protein structure, it becomes more easy to to try and design small molecules that will be able to interact with it. Another example that was on the news, I think it was three years ago, um, was this uh, portrait called the portrait of Edmond Bellamy. This corresponds to a portrait that was not created by a an actual artist. It was created um, de novo, from scratch, uh, by a computer, by an AI algorithm, right? Of course, we can discuss about the quality of this portrait, but I think that the point here is that um, there was a computer that was able to generate or be creative in this case uh, and generate a, pro a portrait of something that resembles someone, I believe, uh, from the 19th century. Um, again, this has this same type of methods uh, has now been implemented in drug discovery and actually um, this last year was also a landmark, landmark year for, uh, for generative models. This is the kind of models that are able to generate um, new uh, images or new uh, text or new entities in general uh, applied to drug discovery because Accentia, which is a company um, based in, in, in Scotland, was able to to bring to clinical trials the first molecule that was completely de, no de novo generated by, uh, by an artificial intelligence. Of course, when I saw <clears throat> that these models are available um, to the community, I also wanted to apply it uh, to our case of interest. And in this case, I used this kind of generative models to, to try and identify <clears throat> by using AI uh, molecules that could be uh, active against uh, malaria in that case, right? And as you can see, uh, and if you are a chemist, you will recognize uh, that, the, the, that the candidates that the, that the artificial intelligence was generating are quite plausible. There was a scaffold that is essentially maintained, and then there were two branches that, that are uh, relatively variable, uh, but, but have some common features also, right? The more blue you see the background is the more active um, the, the model predicts the, those molecules to be in this case against the, the plasmodium falciparum uh, parasite, okay? So uh, bottom line here is that, that if you make enough effort, if you are uh, aware enough of the scientific literature, you are able to, to apply the, the latest advances of machine learning um, uh, into your problems of interest. But of course, how do you do that? So this brings us to the second quarter of this presentation, where I will, I will be presenting the solution that uh, Ercilia and H3D have for this particular problem of uh, disseminating uh, machine learning in laboratories where expertise in data science is lacking. So overall, um, our proposal is that uh, we have to complete a, the machine learning cycle. And what do we mean by that? Machine learning, as you might know, uh, starts always or almost always with some raw data. Machine learning needs data to be trained off with, okay? Um, once we have uh, this raw data assembled, for instance, from, a, from an experiment, as we will see later, we need to process and clean it. This is very important. Once we have clean data, we need to uh, train a machine learning model. This might be the, the most emblematic step of machine learning uh, that is fitting the data, right? Uh, going from an input to an output um, uh, based on a machine learning algorithm, right? Uh, this can be done, uh, this requires a lot of technical skills and essentially this is what we, what, what we do at Ercilia. Once we have um, trained uh, your machine learning model, of course, very importantly, you need to test and tune it if necessary and you need to validate it first internally, that is within the computer and hopefully externally, uh, that is, uh, with, with more experiments, right? Prospective experiments. Most of the machine learning um, that you can find uh, in the scientific literature ends in this uh, cycle, right? Uh, ends with a, with a validation, hopefully with an experimental validation. What's lacking most of the time is the last, uh, the outer cycle here, uh, the, the outer circle here, uh, which is the deployment, right? And, and by deployment, we mean um, packaging the machine learning uh, tool that we have just built in our computers um, 
into something that can be distributed and can be used by others. Uh, so that uh, when we distribute this tool that is uh, deployed or packaged, uh, the experimentalist, who might not be an expert in data science, we will be able to uh, to input um, uh, a question, in for, for example, a drug, a query, and, and get an output for it, for example, the predicted targets of this drug. Okay. If this process is not completed, uh, um, machine learning is essentially, in our opinion, rendered use useless because it cannot be adopted by the broad community. So let me give you two examples of that. Imagine you are reading the scientific literature and you come across this paper that was published last year in the High Impact Journal Cell. Um, in this case, authors uh, from the MIT developed a um, uh, very interesting machine learning model uh, that was able to predict the broad spectrum um, antibiotic activity of, of uh, drug like molecules. And indeed, they were able to predict um, um, very potent antibiotics uh, um, that, that had not been identified previously experimentally. Okay, so um, if you are an experimentalist, uh, you might have trouble um, first going through this paper and second uh, implementing this paper. Uh, so that you can predict the antibiotic activity of your small molecule of interest, right? So what we are trying to do um, within the collaboration that we are having between Nersilia and H3D uh, is, to ident it is to bundle um, the machine learning model that is presented here, to deploy, as, a, as I was describing before, to deploy it, so that um, we provide an interface to experimentalists that is as simple as that, so that they can query their molecule of interest, for instance, halicin, and get a prediction out of the model. In this case, halicin is predicted to be uh, to have a, to be a potent antibiotic. Okay, so this is the first uh, family of models that we are trying to uh, to provide within this to the community within this collaboration. Also, sometimes you might find in the scientific literature not not. Uh, machine learning models, but uh, actually big data sets, right? Um, for instance, um, if you go to the literature, you, you, you might identify a paper like this one, uh, published in, in the, again, high impact journal science in this case in 2018, when they were, where they were um, screening a lot of compounds uh, for their activity against, against the plasmodium parasite. Okay. In this case, I think it was um, half a million compounds. So a lot of a lot of data points. Very interesting paper, a landmark a landmark paper, I would say, uh, in drug discovery for 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 anti malaria. However, it is likely that your molecule of interest is not within this data set, and therefore, and this paper um, might not be so useful to you if your molecule has not been tested by the authors before. So it, it would be desirable in this case to to train a machine learning model that based on that data is going to be able to predict or to infer whether your molecule of interest um, will be active or not against this, the parasite. This is exactly what we do. We go to this data, in this case we go to the, to the supplementary materials that are, are found um, uh, within the paper, download the data and, and train a machine learning model uh, following the cycle that I, that I described uh, uh, in the previous slide. Uh, so, so that um, we can provide an interface to researchers um, as simple as this one, where they can query their molecule of interest and, and get, a, get a prediction of, of the activity. In this case, atovaquone, uh, as we know, um, is predicted to be active. Okay, so um, we really like to work in collaboration, and if you have data sets, in particular data sets of drug discovery, uh, that you think um, are interesting for machine learning model, Modeling, please reach out to us. This is essentially what we are doing with H3D uh, within the, the framework of our collaboration. They have interesting, da they have, uh, interesting data sets uh, in their laboratories and we are trying to build interesting machine learning models so that those data sets can be fully exploited, um, especially to new molecules. Okay. So overall, we are trying to build uh, this Ercilia model hub where we will have, uh, hopefully, a lot of uh, models that are uh, ready to use uh, by by experimentalists. These models, those models, of course, will be related uh, most of them to infectious diseases because uh, this is what's more tightly related to to our mission. So we hopefully will be able to provide models that um, will predict the antibiotic activity of small molecules. But not only this, also the, the toxicity 
uh, the predicted toxicity of the small molecules, whether they will penetrate or not the blood-brain barrier. Um, we will also provide some uh, small molecule generative mo models, as I will show afterwards, etc., etc., etc. Okay. Our plans are to, ha are to have a by the end of uh, the year um, over 500 models uh, deployed uh, and ready to use for everyone. All right, so let's get a little bit more into detail. What are we actually doing within this Ercilia model hub and, and how are we organizing all of these models? Because as you might imagine, uh, there are a lot of possible models that we can do and, and there is, you need a blueprint, you need a, an internal organization to achieve that. Essentially, I think that um, this can be described within the framework of this, um, we call it metagraph, this graph that that in our opinion uh, summarizes very well the type of data that you encounter when you when you browse the scientific literature. Um, because we are focused on biomedicine, our central entity most of the times are genes. And because we are focused on drug discovery, at least today, uh, our another important entity for us is compounds, right? So we know that genes interact with compounds. We know that uh, we know that compounds interact with genes. We know that genes are overexpressed or underexpressed in cell lines. We know that cell lines belong to tissues. We know that tissues are related to diseases. We know that genes um, participate in in, um, in in pathways and, and functions and biological processes, etc. Right. So we first, um, before starting our modeling, we first uh, place all of the data sets that we are gathering within this framework, and this makes it really really easier for us to to automatize our process and, and essentially increase our throughput at, at the time of modeling, as you will see afterwards. So let's go to the third uh, quarter of this presentation, where I, I will try to illustrate a very simple uh, AI task uh, that can be done in drug discovery. And hopefully this will help you uh, better understand what, what I'm talking about when, when I talk about uh, uh, AI in drug discovery. So I, I'm not sure how familiar are you with, with uh, machine learning overall, um, but just, just to be on the same page, machine learning um, can be divided in three uh, families of algorithms, I, I would say. And the most important family and uh, what gets most of the attention um, when it comes to, to drug discovery is supervised machine learning. In supervised machine learning, what you have is labeled data, and what you want to predict uh, is uh, a classification, active or not active, or a regression, more potent or less potent, okay, against a certain assay. This is called supervised machine learning because you need some previous knowledge in order to train your algorithm. Unsupervised learning um, uh, usually can be understood as uh, clustering and projection. This typically applies when you don't have a lot of uh, label data or you don't have label data at all. And what you want to do is to try and discover the underlying structure of your data. For instance, identifying clusters uh, in your data. We will see some examples of it af afterwards. Reinforcement learning. This, um, I think that the image that should come to mind uh, are robots. This is the, a kind of algorithms that essentially uh, learn by interacting with an environment. Okay. A robot would be an example for that. AlphaGo would be an example for that. Um, this, is all, this family of algorithms is also relatively successful in drug discovery uh, because it can be applied uh, to, to the design, the de novo design of, of, of new molecules, for instance, by, by interacting with an environment of a chemist, real like humans, uh, validating or, or invalidating predictions of, of, a, of a machine learning algorithm. Okay? Today we will mostly focus on, on supervised learning. So let's focus on this uh, supervised uh, machine learning task uh, that I promised it to be very simple. Um, if you've been in a laboratory, uh, certainly you, you know this setting. This is a 26 ninth, um, 26 well plate. Uh, and here basically what we are doing is we are dosing. We have uh, E. coli in this case, um, growing in each of these wells, okay? And what we are doing is dosing um, different molecules, okay, against uh, E. coli at different concentrations, okay? When we see purple, this means that the bacteria keeps growing. The bacteria, the bacteria keeps growing. This means that the bacteria are alive, or in other words, um, the drug is inactive, okay? If we see white, 
this means that the, that bacteria are dying and this means that the drug is active against it, right? So now we have this data that is labeled and we want to identify a function, right? A mathematical transformation of this data that is going to be able to distinguish molecules between active and inactive. Yeah, and this is what we usually refer to uh, as uh, machine learning. Of course, life is never so easy. You, we, you really need to fine tune uh, this line. You really need to work hard to identify what is the best separation between uh, the active molecules and the, and the inactive molecules. Why is this important? Is because it's not only important to make a good separation from the data that you have, it's also important uh, to separate for new data. And this problem in general is referred to as overfitting. You might ha have heard this word yeah, if, if you are a data scientist. Um, essentially, let me put here a, a, an example that is a little bit more difficult. Imagine that we have the actives here and we have the inactives here. It's relatively easy to draw a very complex pattern to separate uh, actives and inactives. But of course, when we come with new data, this might not perform so well. So it's usually better to identify simple solutions, right? That we say generalize well. Uh, this simple solution uh, is going it behaves much better with the new data. Okay. So um, in machine learning, like in mo almost everything in science, the simpler the better. We want to find the simplest model that is gonna that is able to split our data satisfactorily. Okay. This is the fitting step. How do we do this fitting step? Uh, this is uh, pretty standard, I would say, in, in machine learning and supervised machine learning for drug discovery. Here we have our training data that I was describing before, labeled as actives and inactives. The first step, and I would say a very a key step uh, when it comes to chemoinformatics and, and, and drug discovery um, uh, based on, on computation, uh, is the filterization of small molecules. So in this step, what you want to do is convert this representation of the molecules, which is what the chemist can understand, into something that the computer can understand, right? And, and computers understand numbers, uh, they don't understand drawings, right? So um, the first step is usually referred to as um, description or filterization of the input data, and, um, and this is a key step in, 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 in drug discovery. So you have to convert your input molecules into a numerical representation of them, okay? We will see now how this can be done. Once you have a numerical representation, then you have to choose a machine learning algorithm, and there's many out there. Uh, there's really no need for inventing, uh, reinventing the wheel. There's many machine learning models out there that perform very well. Uh, surely uh, they will perform very well in most of the scenarios. Uh, and all what you have to do is to convert these numbers that are the, the numerical representation of your input data into a classification, right? To, into an active and inactive. So you, co you go from numbers to labels, yeah? Uh, this can be done, as I said, uh, with uh, a machine learning algorithm of, of choice, a classifier in this case, okay? Once you have uh, trained your classifier, um, you have to bundle it, as I described before, and so that when you come with a new molecule for which you don't have the activity, now it's not necessary to do the experiment anymore, anymore because you just have to fiaturize this molecule, convert it into uh, numbers, uh, into a vector of numbers, and, and then pass this vector to your trained model so that you will get a prediction, right? In this case, I'm predicting that this molecule uh, is going to be active, okay? Um, because it, it has some resemblance uh, to the active molecules uh, here, okay? Uh, so this is essentially what's happening in, in supervised machine learning in drug discovery, and I would say that uh, the vast majority of, 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 of tools that are made available out there in drug discovery relate to this type of tasks. Very good, now let's move to the last part of the presentation, which is going to be a little bit longer where I'm going to try to provide uh, real case uh, applications of, of AI uh, and I'm going to move a little bit away of, of this toy example that I was showing into something that is a little bit more complex and, and but also more real. 
So for this, I want to introduce the, the chemical checker, which is the technology that I have developed uh, over uh, the last couple of years and that was published last year in, in the journal Nature Biotechnology. The chemical checker is really the backbone uh, technology that, that we are using as, as a non-profit uh, in Ercilia. So the motivation uh, of the chemical checker and actually the, the main idea behind it is to focus not only on the fitting step, which is what usually gets most of the attention. Um, the fitting step actually has, um, as I said before, a lot of uh, good enough solutions out there. Where we usually have the problem um, as modelers in drug discoveries in the futurization step, that is in, uh, on figuring out how to convert input data, and that in this case the structure of compounds, into something that the computer can understand, okay, into numbers. And the better and the more accurate and the more informative this futurization step is, uh, is and uh, the better eventually is going to be our machine learning model that we train, okay? So um, with the chemical checker, we are trying to perform state-of-the-art uh, feturization uh, of, of small molecules. So let me give you an example of that. So classically, um, maybe there are some chemoinformaticians in the room. Uh, you might recognize these, uh, these concepts uh, here. Mm, classically, in, in drug discovery or in chemoinformatics, what you do is you, is you look at a, at a small molecule and you enumerate the structural features, we call it, uh, that we can identify in this small molecule. For instance, uh, you can see that this small molecule has a chloride attached to a carbon, so we put a 1 in this vector, okay, that represents the structural features of the compound. Okay? Uh, we, we find a fluoride uh, attached to a carbon, so we put a 1 here in the position in the vector uh, that corresponds to a carbon fluoride bond. Um, hydroxide or aromatic bonds, uh, nitrogens, etc., etc., etc. Right. So by enumerating the structural features that we can find in a small molecule, we can derive a vector of zeros and ones, typically, that encodes uh, the, the structure of the molecule. Right. So this molecule has this particular vector. Right. Yeah. So this arrow here is doing the feturization that I was referring to. This is how feturization has been done uh, classically um, in drug discovery, and, uh, and, and I would say it has been the state of the art un until very recently, until the, the recent years. However, um, we now know a lot about small molecules. Uh, we are in the era of big data, and actually if we look for this molecule, uh, we do not only encounter the structure of it, but we also encounter a lot more information. For instance, we know that this molecule is actually anti-malarial. We know what it does. It's a blood skin, a skin, a schizonticide. Um, we actually know that it interacts with, with some uh, processes uh, of the human body. Uh, we, has, we know that it has some adverse toxicity events, etc., etc., etc. Okay. So we not only know the structure of the mo of the small molecule as we as it used to happen before. We know much more. So what we've done in practice with the chemical checker is to uh, to gather a lot of information from from the from the public domain, from databases that are available out there for researchers, and and structure it in a way that is convenient for uh, for this processing of data into um, informative uh, feature vectors. Yeah. So um, the way we've done it is uh, we've divided. Uh, the data that is available out there in five levels of complexity. The first level is the chemistry. In this level, we are trying to capture um, the structural properties of the molecules, as I was saying, and the 2D structure, the 3D structure, uh, the scaffolds that we can identify uh, for these molecules, the physical chemical properties, etc., etc. In the second level of complexity, we try to uh, gather and capture and collect um, the, the targets and off-targets of those molecules, that is the mechanism of action, the drug metabolizing enzymes, um, the, the off-targets of the molecules, the, the, the binding evidence that we can find in high-throughput screening assays, etc. Um, in the third level of complexity, we try to um, put these targets uh, within the context uh, of um, of the biological systems, right? Of of the, of the cells, I would say, uh, and and for this we use a lot of bioinformatics tools uh, to sort of map the targets of the molecules, 
um, into signaling pathways, biological processes, protein-protein interaction networks, uh, etc. In the fourth level of complexity, we actually go to cell-based experiments, uh, and, and typically those cell-based experiments, um, what they measure is uh, phenotypic outcomes of, of, of the dosing of small molecules uh, against uh, cell cultures. And, uh, and one of the phenotypic outcomes that we can measure is, for instance, the changes in, in gene expression or the growth inhibition, as we were describing before, or changes in, of morphology, etc. Yeah? So this is the kind of data that we try to gather uh, for cell-based assays. And finally, for the few molecules for which um, uh, we have clinical data, we, we gather the therapeutic uh, indications of the molecules, but also the side effects and the, to the known toxicologies of the molecules and also the drug-drug interactions. Okay? So, uh, as of today, we have uh, almost one million molecules in our uh, chemical checker uh, database. Um, and, and this is by far the major uh, small molecule database uh, um, of integrated data that is amenable for, for machine learning because it has been theaterized accordingly. Right, so um, as you can imagine, this has been a massive um, task in terms of uh, data management and data engineering. But uh, to, cut, to cut a lot, uh, long story short, um, now if you browse the chemical checker, um, if you have a molecule of interest, you will be given uh, as output uh, the vectors correspondingly that capture the information that I was describing, the chemistry of the molecules, but also the targets of the molecules, the networks, uh, the cell-based assays, and the clinical data, hopefully. So, um, just to give you um, a snapshot of our database, as I said, the database has about one million compounds. Uh, here I'm just showing um, a few hundreds of them. You can see that this database is not human readable, it's machine readable because this database is um, in particular tailored for uh, downstream machine learning, right? Um, and uh, you can see here each row is one molecule. And you can see that we have numbers that represent capture, embed, the, inform the chemical information that we have for each of the molecules, but also the targets, the network information, the cell-based information, and also the clinical information. And what's interesting here, of course, is that you can see some patterns. So, for instance, molecules that are related to neurology, they tend to have uh, some common patterns when it comes to targets and, and response in cell lines. Same happens with uh, infectious diseases, right? Uh, in the clinics, for, for instance, etc., etc., etc. So, um, before the chemical checker, I would say the classical solution was to only capture in vectors the, the chemical data. Now, thanks to the chemical checker, we have um, uh, vectors, features of, a small, of a small molecules that are much more informative and therefore, hopefully, um, will produce eventually better machine learning models. Let me give you an example. Uh, an example of that. Here I'm, I'm showing a map uh, of compounds. Uh, Ten thousand compounds uh, can be found in this map. Um, and here, what I'm doing is um, I'm taking the the chemical checker signature of these molecules. That is, uh, I simply stack all of, all of the chemical data, targets, network cells, and clinics data into one uh, numerical vector, and I project it. Uh, I project it into this space. Okay. So um, here, two points are two molecules, uh, and if they are close by, uh, this means that these two, these two molecules have similar signatures. This means that th those two molecules, in light of the chemical checker, they have similar properties. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that you want to observe here is, th is that there are clusters. This means, uh, uh, molecule, th this means that molecules uh, are organized in families. And, and these clusters probably correspond to molecules that have similar properties. And um, if you look at the colors of these clusters, you can see that some of the clusters are red. When clusters are red, this means that uh, it corresponds to molecules that are indeed chemically similar. Yeah. So you would expect that molecules that are chemically similar, indeed, they have uh, similar properties. This is the case, for instance, for the estrogen receptor um, uh, inhibitors. All of these molecules in this very red cluster, they really look alike and they all inhibit uh, the same protein, right, as expected. But we can find blue clusters also that correspond to molecules that they do not 
uh, look similar from a chemical perspective, but nonetheless they have very similar properties. For instance, in this cluster here, we can we can see molecules that they, they are very different uh, chemically, um, but uh, they they do have the same uh, protein target in this case, uh, this GSK3B uh, kinase. Same happens with MAPK kinases, which are uh, very important for cancer. Okay. So with the chemical checker, we are not only able to recapitulate previous knowledge, that is, molecules that were chemically similar will have chemical, uh, similar chemical activities, but we are also able to discover groups of molecules that are not chemically similar, but nonetheless they will have um, similar biological activities when delivered to human, uh, which might be very important uh, for the discovery of, of truly new molecules. Okay, so um, let, let me just focus a little bit more on what I'm talking about. For instance, in this case, I'm showing um, three maps here. Each map here corresponds to a type of data in, within the chemical checker. The first map corresponds to the, the transcriptional response, that is the gene expression uh, response that we identify for small molecules uh, uh, within, uh, in cell-based assays. The second map corresponds to cell sensitivity profiles, that is um, molecules that are close in this map, uh, they, they tend to uh, inhibit the growth uh, of the same type of cells. Uh, and the third map corresponds to chemical structure, right? So molecules that are um, close by in this map, uh, they are chemically similar. If they are far apart, this means that they are chemically different. So this particular case um, shows um, an interesting example where we find molecules that they do essentially the same phenotypic effect on cells, right? Cells seem to respond very similarly to these molecules, but when we look at their structure, and those molecules are depicted here, we can see that they do not look alike. Yeah. So this is a very interesting case in terms of drug discovery because we are finding molecules that they appear to be unre unrelated, but probably they are not. Probably they have a very similar mechanism of action, and indeed, in, in this case, all of these molecules interact with, um, with DNA. Um, it's known that, that they interact uh, with DNA, those three they do. Um, this is a new molecule that has not been characterized and we believe uh, it will have the same mechanism of action because it behaves very similarly in, uh, in cells. Uh, exactly this, the opposite exercise we can do. For instance, in this case I'm focusing on, on antibiotics. Those are two very popular families of antibiotics. Yeah, uh, The first one, this one corresponds to the orange dots here and this one corresponds to the purple dots here and as we can see when we look at the chemical structure of those molecules as expected uh, this family of antibiotics they all cluster together this family of antibiotics they all cluster together they indeed have the same mechanism of action they do the same thing on the pathogen yeah but when we look at the transcriptional profiles that is human cell lines and how they respond we can see that there is a lot of a sparsity here Right, right, and this might explain why those molecules, even if they look alike, even if they have the same mechanism of action, they inhibit the same targets in the parasite, they they can cause a very different uh, um, effects on humans, right? And this explains why uh, it is necessary to fine tune um, families of antibiotics so that they'll become, for instance, less toxic. Right, now let's move to, to two examples for which we actually provide some experimental validation and those two examples will be related to a very particular type of data which are transcriptional profiles of, of, of cell lines. Basically what happens uh, in this type of data is that you expose a cell line uh, to a drug treatment and the cell line responds with changes of gene expression uh, and you measure these changes of gene expression. So the vectors that you observe here the signatures uh, that you observe here uh, in the chemical checker essentially uh, describe uh, what genes go up and what genes go down um, in the cell line when they are exposed to a certain drug. The nice thing about uh, this type of data is that you can link it uh, to other types of data that you might have in your laboratory. For instance, you might have used um, an antibody to inhibit your target of interest, in this case the IL-2 receptor, uh, and this antibody might be daclizumab, which is a which is a drug, a biological drug, not a chemical drug, uh, a, a against this target, right? And we can use the chemical checker, and you can measure the gene expression profile of, of this um, um, biological drug treatment. And we can use the chemical checker 
to essentially identify molecules that will have the same transcriptional profile uh, as your biological drug of interest. So we are identifying in practice uh, chemical mimetics of this uh, um, antibody drug. Why is this interesting? Because uh, as we might know, as you might know, uh, antibody drugs are uh, difficult uh, to produce, um, they have difficult pharmacokinetics and most importantly they might be very expensive. So uh, finding small molecule analogs which might be uh, cheaper um, can, can be instrumental to, to, to make um, to make a treatment that can that can reach uh, a, bro a broader population, okay. So in this case, what we are we are we are presenting is a is a machine learning methodology that uses the the data that is gathered within the chemical checker to identify uh, small molecules that um, that will be very similar to uh, to in terms of gene expression uh, to an antibody drug that we know is already working, yeah. Right, so we did that, we did that the screening, uh, we screened uh, in the computer um, uh, about 10,000 molecules and we came up with um, less than 20 candidates, I think it was 19 candidates, uh, of which when we did the experiments in vitro, uh, 14 worked to some degree. Yeah, those would be uh, four candidates that we that we identified. As you can see, first um, first of all, those candidates they do not look uh, similar chem chemically, right? Uh, this means that the, that our tool is able to identify a, uh, <coughs> a broad variety of, of of compounds that we can of lead compounds uh, virtually that that uh, we can uh, pursue further in the drug development process. Um, if you go to the actual experiments, you can see here the clizumab. You, you you see the, the expected uh, <clears throat> those um, those dependent response right so the the, the more the more those we put of the um the the higher the effect and when we look at our drugs of interest you can see that that um, that, that they behave quite similarly to to the clizumab, right so by only by using the computer we were able to shortlist uh, shortlist of small molecules that that might have a, a similar effect to to our uh, the clizumab of interest. Uh, exactly the same thing we can do um, uh, with the reverse approach. In this case, um, imagine we have a disease of interest, um, Alzheimer's, for instance, for which we get we gather gene expression data in the laboratories. This is common practice. Um, you want to have a a transcriptional profile, a gene expression profile, a gene expression signature that characterizes your disease. Yeah. You want to identify in a disease state which are the genes that are up and which are the genes that are down, right, as compared to the healthy state. So an, a hypothesis that we can make here is that we can identify molecules that have a transcriptional profile that is completely opposite to it, yeah, so that when you expose this molecule to the disease uh, cell line or animal, uh, it's going to revert uh, uh, the gene expression profile, the, dis the disease characteristic gene expression profile to a healthy, to a healthy one, because the, the characteristic gene expression profile of the molecule is opposite to it. Okay? We had a matching experiment before, a mimicking experiment before, now we have a reversion experiment. We did uh, this within the context of a very large uh, um, project that we had in, in the laboratory uh, two years ago and and in that case uh, related to Alzheimer's and here I'm just focusing on a very particular arrow of this uh, very complex uh, data data driven search for for candidates against Alzheimer's in this case we we developed um, um, cell cell based models um, <clears throat> for for Alzheimer's and we were trying to, and as I described, uh, we, we characterize those molecules from a transcriptional perspective and vir virtually in the computer and using the chemical checker, we screened for molecules that had a completely opposite profile um, to the disease characteristic uh, gene expression profile. We did that for 8,000 molecules and again we came up uh, with a short list of candidates. Um, um, here I'm showing three of them, the best of them, at least on the computer. Uh, and as you can see, those candidates, when we measure, um, when we actually dose them in the laboratory uh, to the, to the uh, cell-based Alzheimer's models, you can see that the characteristic uh, genes that were going down or up in the Alzheimer's state are reverted to a sort of healthy state. 
okay this happens for for these three molecules and this is not anecdotal actually this is the case for many or many of the genes that are dysregulated in, in, in the Alzheimer's models okay so um, by by using uh, this data-driven approach we were able to virtually screen and and shortlist some kind of candidates that can be pursued for for Alzheimer's uh, I hope I I've been able to convince you that that um, that the data-driven approach is it's it's interesting or can be very interesting for drug discovery but of course um, you might argue or you might complain that for most of the molecules and there actually there are actually a lot of molecules out there uh, a lot of commercially available molecules for most of the molecules we we do not have information right many of the molecules are new or many of the molecules are to be discovered and for for them we will not have information so how can we apply a data-driven approach actually um, if we if we are being honest and we want to uh, and we explore the molecules that we have been uh, including within the chemical checker we are just including a very small proportion of it we are just include one million um, when when actually the, the space of commercial compounds is is over the hundreds of millions of millions of molecules so I would say that a more honest view of the chemical checker would be something like this where we Indeed, we always have chemical information for any of the molecules that we can find out there, but when it comes to experimental information, um, we lack it for most of the molecules, especially in, the, in, the, in these levels, in the cell-based levels and the clinical le levels, where the experiments are more exp expensive and therefore not available for most of the molecules. So um, in the last year, and in, in this work that we published in Nature Communications actually one month ago, um, we have been trying to impute uh, all of the missing data in, in the chemical checker so so that we have uh, information available for many of the compounds not not only for for the privileged compounds that have uh, been uh, tested experimentally and intensively and for this we developed a, um, a neural network a very complex neural network called, called Siamese neural network and today I believe it's not the day to talk about uh, the details of this neural network uh, just to simplify uh, this neural network uh, leverages for each molecule that we are interested in leverages the available information that we can find out there even if it's only chemical information and tries to impute the rest okay and this is done with a type of neural network architecture uh, that is well performing in in um, low data settings this Siamese neural network uh, takes a lot of uh, computational effort to compute and for this we we accessed the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. This is the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. I believe this is the most beautiful uh, supercomputer in the world. Uh, it's placed uh, inside the church. As you might know, Barcelona is a hot city, and uh, this kind of setting uh, can can provide some cooling to the computer. So, long story short, after training this Siamese neural network, we can go from incomplete data, which is what you, we usually have for most of the molecules, to something that is inferred, uh, approximate, but uh, complete. Okay, so uh, in this particular molecule, we only had chemical information and a few experimental data. After applying inference with this Siamese neural network, we were able to uh, infer th the rest of the signatures. Yeah. Of course, uh, we are aware that this is this task uh, might be easy sometimes and might be difficult sometimes, and, and actually we are we are we are trying to measure the accuracy of each of the predictions. As you can see, some predictions um, are usually quite good. For instance, when we try to predict uh, the binding signatures, we are we usually do it very well. But when it comes to more difficult signatures, especially the phenotypic signatures, transcriptional signatures, for instance. Um, we might have some errors, okay? And not, not only this, we can identify in these maps what are the high confidence regions and what are the low confidence regions. So we are trying or we are doing our best to make this inference as transparent as possible. I think that this is very important when you do machine learning, especially when you are collaborating uh, with experimentalists. After doing this procedure, um, life becomes much more easy for the data scientist because essentially for each of the molecules that you can think of you can get a prediction 
and and which was not the case before when we didn't have the ability to have inference for or we had incomplete data for most of the molecules so now uh, thanks to this tool uh, that has been just released um, we can take any molecules for instance here I'm taking uh, drug molecules uh, produce the chemical checker signatures that is this uh, long numerical vector that captures all of this information uh, from the chemical uh, from chemical data to clinical data and map it in two dimensions and when you do that you can see very interesting patterns for instance here we can see that molecules that are used currently uh, for infectious diseases they cluster in certain regions of the bioactivity map of the chemical checker map uh, molecules that are used in psychiatry they also cluster in one in one particular regions molecules for cardiology endocrinology uh, oncology etc not only this we can do exactly the same procedure for metabolites for instance so you can see here uh, that molecules uh, human metabolites are very different as expected as uh, saccharomyces uh, metabolites even within human metabolites we can um, stratify by tissue and you can see that uh, saliva molecules that can be found in saliva are different to the molecules that can be found in the cere cerebrospinal fluid uh, in sweat etc or we can even look at food ingredients right we can and, and if we do that we can see that molecules that can be found uh, in meat ingredients that can be found in meat as expected are different to ingredients that can be found in mushrooms for instance or in coffee so with this uh, we have a tool a, a ready to use machine learning tool that can very easily uh, provide features um, for any molecule of interest and going back to our uh, initial um, malaria examples uh, this has allowed us to to act to be to make very fast predictions for many 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 molecules that we think can be useful for for malaria in this map uh, the red region here uh, corresponds to a region of molecules that we believe might be highly potent against uh, malaria if we focus a little bit uh, you can see that they look like this and this indeed is a, is a known family of of of, of potential anti-malarials okay um, so so these kind of um, um, tools like the chemical checker and the ones that we are trying to build together with h3d uh, should really allow us to to conduct uh, data-driven research uh, more fastly and and more accurately than than we used to do before so to summarize um, with the chemical checker uh, we go from and the classical featureization that was only focusing on the chemical structure into something that is much more complete and if we do that we have the ability to to make better predictions more informative predictions because we have embedded a lot of uh, uh, historical data experimental data available for for the compounds in our feature vectors yeah for instance uh, just uh, just as an example if we take uh, if we try to predict the toxicity of a, of a panel of 10,000 small molecules and toxicity here is measured by by the by the activity of of, of 12 uh, different toxicity related pathways in in the human body uh, you can see here in blue the machine learning uh, predictors that you obtain using the chemical checker signatures and here in red the machine learning predictors that you obtain using classical signatures and um, that is only the chemical structure and most of the times uh, as you can see here uh, we we outperform the state of the art okay so I think this is all I want to talk about today. Just a few take home messages. I hope I was able to convince you that implementing AI is possible uh, in drug discovery, uh, if done in, especially if done in collaboration with laboratories and, and field researchers. Uh, we are building together with H3D in the Arcelia Model Hub, which is gonna be the first uh, repository of pre-trained uh, AI models related to drug discovery. Ercilia uh, has a backbone technology, which is called the chemical checker, which is uh, to date the largest research of, resource of bioactivity signatures uh, publicly available to the community. Those bioactivity signatures are, as you have seen, numerical vectors that capture all of the information that we can find uh, for small molecules. Uh, and they can be used to visualize compound collections uh, in, two, in two dimensions, for instance, as you have seen, to match and revert uh, genetic signatures and uh, most importantly to boost the performance of, of AI algorithms downstream. Uh, we are a non-profit initiative. If you have uh, uh, questions or if you need support in AI, please reach out to us. 
thanks for your attention. It's been a pleasure to present today uh, here at BioAfrica and see you next time.